uh, the live has been started ma'am please proceed welcome professor aluwalia welcome everybody good morning uh, morning professor aluwalia good morning sir good morning so kya you can start yeah let us start yes and i hope there are more people who join as we proceed and maybe there are some so good morning everybody to this morning's proceedings this is a lecture climate induced geo hazards in the himalaya and plausible mitigation this has been organized by <laughs> spsti and our associates are the chandigarh chapters of nasi inyas and insa it is my pleasure to welcome dr kalachand sen director wadia institute today's speaker and also today's guest of honor dr shailesh naik director nias dr naik is also member of spsti it is also a pleasure to welcome stalwarts from our department of geology professor parampreet kaur and professor rajiv patnaik and also a very warm welcome to all present here so now i request professor arun grover vice president spsti to open the session good morning all i am delighted to add my welcome to the distinguished speaker dr kala chand sen the guest of honor professor salesh naik and our audience on the occasion of an important expository public lecture on the contemporary topic of climate change induced geo hazards in the himalaya and their possible mitigation the spsti had hosted an online expository lecture on the topic cooperation to preserve the himalayan ecological system by professor shailesh naik about 2 years ago on march 9 2021 Professor Naik's lecture had been very educative for all of us about the geology of Himalaya and its importance as lifeline for the sustenance of civilization in the Indian subcontinent. In the backdrop of happenings in the Joshimat region, which started to get highlighted in the media some months ago, the president of SP, SPSTI, Mr. Dharamveer, felt that we must revisit the topic of Himalayan geology. and provide an opportunity to the civic society to learn, learn about the present reality from an expert since spsti had invited professor salesh naik to serve as the advisor of spsti after his scintillating lecture and he had agreed to be an advisor for us we approached professor naik once again for a revisit lecture he recommended to us instead a lecture by dr kala chand sen who is serving as the director of wadia institute of himalayan geology at tera dil i therefore wrote to dr sen and provided him the background of earlier lecture by professor naik luckily for us dr sen readily accepted the invite and professor naik also consented to serve as a guest of honor today we are grateful to both of them indeed i am tempted to briefly share with you on today's occasion my personal fascination and admiration for the inspiring life of professor dn wadia after whom the institute of himalayan geology at dehradun is named this institute had been created in few rooms of delhi university campus Hello. just about a year before the passing away of professor wadia in 1969 dr wadia was is regarded as a founding honorary director of wadia institute and wadia the wadia institute actually had moved to dehradun only in 1976 and it was named wadia institute after the passing away of dr wadia i had first come across the name of dr wadia as the member of the atomic research committee chaired by homi bhaba which was created by dr s s bhatnagar within the csr system at the end of the second world war 
which happened by the dropping of two nuclear bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August of 1945. Dr. Wadia was included in the said committee for atomic research by virtue of his 1943 proposal on the creation of a central board on mineral research and advice on mineral technology, which he wrote while serving as the vice president of National Institute of Sciences in 1943-44. Dr. Wadia had been elected as a fellow of the Royal Society in 1957, and a postal stamp had been released to commemorate his birth century in 1984. However, I must confess that I had not cared to learn about him more till very recently. I was unaware of Dr. Wadia's link with Punjab University and the inspiration he provided to the researchers in Northwest of India in the initial decades of the 20th century. For the Punjab University fraternity, Professor Wadia was a contemporary of Professor Shivram Kashyap, the first Indian scientist researcher who started to do significant research at Lahore. Professor Wadia had joined as faculty member in the newly opened government college at Jammu, which was named as Prince of Wales College in 1906. And Mr. Shivaram Kashyap, who had his degrees in medical as well as basic sciences, he had joined as a lecturer in government college Lahore in 1908. The colleges at Lahore and Jammu were both affiliated colleges of Punjab University. And at that time, there were no university lecturers and no university departments. The appointment of university lecturers and the honor school system of Punjab University commenced after 1919. However, in 1920 itself, Dr. Wadia left Jammu to accept a position in the Geological Survey of India, from where he superannuated in 1938. And after that, he had moved to Sri Lanka and he returned to India as an advisor to national government uh, chaired by Pandit Nehru before the independence. May I conclude my brief address today by appealing to the students and faculty of Punjab University to read about the life and times of Dr. D.N. Wadia on the Wikipedia and on the pages of Memoirs of INSA or the Memoirs of Royal Society and explores his connect connections with the initiation of research in the Northwest of, of India, namely the erstwhile Punjab, which comprises today the entire region from Delhi West onwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Grover. Very illuminating. And now I request Professor Parampreet Kaur, a very well-known geologist herself, from our Department of Geology, Punjab University, to introduce the guest of honor today, Professor Kaur. Thank you, ma'am. It's a proud privilege to have Professor Selesh Nayak amongst us as our distinguished guest of honor for today's occasion. Professor Nayak is currently serving as the director of National Institute of Advanced Studies a very prestigious institute located in the campus of Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He's also the chancellor of Terry School of Advanced Studies, Delhi. Professor Nayak is such a renowned academician who needs no introduction. He was the chair of the Earth System Science Organization and Earth Commission in in fact, he has initiated several new programs and centers related to global change and earth system science. He has also served as a distinguished scientist and secretary to the government of India for Ministry of Earth Sciences and director of the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services Hyderabad. Professor Nayak earned his PhD from University of Baroda and has made significant research contributions in the field of oceanography and remote sensing. 
he set up the state of the art early warning system for tsunami and storm surges in the indian ocean he has developed the methodology for potential fishing zones for saving fuel and time he has developed techniques and algorithms for identification of various coastal landforms and mangrove plant communities a scholar par excellence professor nayak has earned several distinctions and awards as follows to name a few he is a fellow indian national science academy new delhi and fellow indian Vaasana. academy of sciences bangalore and the fellow the national academy of sciences alabad he is a recipient of hari narayanan lifetime achievement award 2013 and vikram sara bhai memorial award 2012 and bhaskar award 2010 and web ratna platinum award for excellence in e governance initiative for tsunami early warning system 2010 and scotch challenger award for security and disaster management and indian research space research organization team award for snow and glacier project 2009 and 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 the list goes on and on i hope professor nayak would excuse us if we have missed any of his significant contributions so friends it is indeed a pleasure for us to have such a diligent researcher as today's guest of honor thank you sir for sparing your valuable time and be a part of today's occasion once again professor nayak thank you thank you very much uh, for very generous introduction for a bit i think uh, my pleasure all, sir it's all part of the team work actually i have been only incidental to be there uh, i'm extremely grateful for inviting me to sri dharambir ji kr ji and dr arun grover uh, to participate in such a important discussion the we all know that the climate change is already happening it's not that it is going to be in future but it is a global issue but the mitigation which we have to do is at a local issue and uh, we also know various extreme events which are happening which is very visible to everyone either floods or rains or a, but there are many other uh, which are gradual processes also could lead to many hazards and uh, that is where the issue is because our knowledge about the geological processes which are occurring very slowly which is not exactly visible unless you keep on measuring with a very advanced instruments this also may may not be always all such thing we may be able to link either to the climate change or to the development of pressure or to large engineering projects but i think we did not have to worry much about the cause of such events but more important is how do we address them and the all such cases the knowledge required for any engineering solution or any other solution may not be sufficient but at the same time i think our response has to be based on the whatever knowledge exist and i'm sure that the government also looks based on the information more and more uh, about such processes and that is why i suggested dr kalachan who has been on the forefront of uh, making lot of such measurements in the himalaya and link it to these aspects to understand various geological processes not only that also the model the same 
And uh, unless you model, you will not be able to predict even in the future. And I think that is where the most important aspect we need to have is how best we were able to predict such events. And lastly, I think also the consciousness of the people or the awareness of the people in the surrounding is also equally important to address any uh, thing about the mitigation. Because unless the people are aware and ready to adopt to certain measures which may be useful for mitigating such hazards. So I'm sure that many of this thing Dr. Kalachan will address. I don't want to take more time and be between you and Kalachan. I'm extremely grateful for the honor which you have given me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Naik, for those nice words and also for focusing on the important issues. Thank you. And now, I request Professor Rajiv Patnaik, another very accomplished geologist from our Department of Geology of Punjab University, Chandigarh, to introduce the speaker, Professor Patnaik. Thank you, madam. <clears throat> Good morning to all. Uh, this is really a proud privilege and honor. And in fact, it's a, uh, uh, this is my pleasant duty to introduce uh, our very renowned geologist of our country, Dr. Kala Chan Sain is presently the director of Wadia Institute of Geology, Dehradun. <clears throat> Dr. Sain uh, did his uh, BSc from Burdwan University uh, in 1984, followed by his uh, MSc MTech from uh, uh, the prestigious uh, IIT Dhanbad. <clears throat> then he did, did his PhD from uh, NGRI. Uh, again from Hyderabad. And then he went uh, for uh, postdoctoral fellowships. Uh, he uh, went to Cambridge uh, uh, in 1997, followed by uh, Rice University, uh, USA in 1999. And in 2003, again, he, he did his uh, postdoc uh, on, a, on a different uh, uh, subject. He has... Uh, several academic uh, achievements and uh, he in fact uh, uh, he joined as a field officer uh, at the uh, IIT Dhanbad in uh, 1988 and then uh, as a GRF and then uh, SRF at uh, CSIR Institute and GRI and uh, then followed by that he he joined as a scientist B scientist C, and then he promote, was promoted to scientist E, uh, and principal scientist, uh, and chief scientist, uh, and uh, uh, at the CSIR and GRI uh, Institute. Then uh, from 2009, uh, 19 onwards, he's the uh, uh, director of uh, the Wadia Institute of Himalayan Geology. And he has also uh, uh, um, uh, he's also a guest faculty uh, at uh, University of Hyderabad, Rajasthan Technical University, and a professor at ACSIR uh, Hyderabad. And, and he's uh, an outstanding professor at the Academy of Scientific and Innovative Research, Ghaziabad. He has supervised several uh, PhD students and has trained uh, more than 70 MSc uh, students uh, and has been involved in uh, both research and teaching and has been uh, has re uh, achieved uh, a huge uh, amount of uh, uh, research success in uh, particularly establishing a gas hydrate research center at NGRI then um, uh, uh, Uttarakhand, uh, um, uh, Himalayas, the the uh, earthquake uh, prone areas. Then he also established uh, an artificial and intelligence center uh, uh, and seismic interpretation center at the Wadia Institute. So uh, his achievements are uh, tremendous, and uh, he uh, in fact uh, chairs several uh, scientific committees today. Uh, uh, of our uh, country, and uh, he chairs the SCRB DST, uh, IRFA, uh, and 
MHRD uh, DST schemes. He's uh, in uh, advisory committees, uh, uh, program advisory committees of uh, uh, all the major uh, funding agencies of our country. Uh, he has been a recipient of several uh, awards. Uh, I'll just name a few because there are uh, many, many. So Uttarakhand Ratanshri Award, he, uh, he received uh, in 2022, very recently. And uh, then a National uh, Award of Excellence in Geosciences in uh, 2021, uh, um, National Mineral Award, uh, Swarnajanti Award, Young Scientist Award, many, many awards he has been, uh, he has received. And also he has been bestowed with uh, several prestigious fellowship, uh, J.C. Bosch National Fellowship, and he's a, a fellow of Indian National Academy, a fellow of in, uh, Indian Academy of Science, uh, a, a fellow of Nasi Allahabad, and a fellow uh, of uh, Indian Social Science Academy. So he he's uh, he's been uh, uh, fellow of many many uh, learned prestigious societies. So his uh, achievement on and on, he's, he's uh, on the editorial boards of many uh, internationally re recognized uh, high impact journals. And uh, uh, he has uh, received many, many external research fundings from uh, SCRB, uh, uh, Swarnajanti fellowships. So uh, the, the achievements goes on and publication, he has, uh, he has published more than 305 uh, uh, papers. His uh, uh, citation index is uh, uh, over uh, 3,700, H index 34, uh, and I-10 index 82. So I would uh, uh, now request uh, uh, Dr. Sai to please deliver his uh, lecture. Thank you, Professor Patnaik, for that eloquent introduction. And now I request Dr. Kalachan Sen to start his lecture. Dr. Sen. A very good morning. Am I audible to everybody? Yes. Yes. And thank you, Patnakji, uh, for giving a lot of information about me. And uh, first of all, I thank um, SPSTI, uh, who is organizing this lecture, along with this Chandigarh chapter of NASI, INYS, and INSHA. I thank um, Professor Silas Naikji, who is our chairman, Research Advisory Council, and um, all the distinguished fellows, members are present over here. And uh, Professor Garambirji, Professor Orun Gurubarji, Professor Keaji, um, and um, many other people, um, uh, Alu Aliaji, and many others who are attending this uh, particular lecture online. So I am really honored and privileged to share some of my thoughts, views on very important topic, what we have uh, chosen and what we are uh, discussing today on the several issues, what is happening into the Himalaya, not only by the climate um, impacted, but also by several natural processes, several other um, anthropogenic or developmental activities. So as a responsible citizen, as a geoscientist, as a policy maker, we have a greater responsibility to safeguard the Himalayan ecosystem, to understand the processes and give some sort of mitigation measures. So in that aspect, there are many, many issues, but I will restrict uh, to next uh, 50 minutes to some of the important issues, uh, what I am going to talk today on that uh, particular case. First of all, since we are talking today geohazards in the Himalaya, so it will be good to have some sort of idea if we know how the Himalaya has been evolved in the geological past 55 million years back in when that Indian plate collided with the Eurasian plate or Asian plate. And 
that has led uh, to the evolution of the Himalaya. And you can see because of this convergence of the Indian plate, we need the Eurasian plate. There have been a lot of stripping of materials and that has stacked one after another and built the, multi -hima the mighty Himalaya 2,500 kilometer long stretch approximately from Nanga Parbat um, into the northwest to Namche Barwa into the northeast. And if we look into uh, some of the cross sections from south to north, then we can see that several tectonic elements we call the faults um, that, that have divided the Himalaya into several regions and each region has its implication for various purposes, including the hazards. So we have seen one of the important uh, geological and tectonic element, Himalayan frontal thrust, main boundary thrust, main central thrust, and southern Tibetan detachment that has divided the Himalaya from the south into different regions called Indo-Gangetic Plain, South Himalaya, Lesser Himalaya, Higher Himalaya, Tethian Himalaya, then Tibetan plates. What we can see from this figure that there is an interface between the um, Indian plate and the overriding or Himalayan wedge, which we define as the main Himalayan thrust. And this has a lot of implications if we understand, if we can map, if we can image using seismological seismic data, the subsurface disposition of this MHT and its configuration or geometry give a lot of implications to understand the seismogenesis of this region. So when you talk about Himalaya, Himalaya has plethora of resources and all of us know that the high altitude glaciers, snow fields, and there have been unique pressure temperature regime into the Himalaya that a lot of precious minerals and ore bodies are formed. In between, there was Tethys Sea after the closure of the Tethys Sea and the collision, and we have seen a lot of fossilies fossiliferous material, sediments have come up. And this Himalayan region also have a lot of basins which are prospective for hydrocarbons. We have a lot of springs which can be utilized for our deep spring purposes, cold springs, as well as hot springs, which can be used as a geothermal green energy resources. We have around the year sunshine and wind. And if you look into the mighty rivers, the water and sediment transmit, have made the Himalaya a center stage for habitation. But if we look into the several processes, what is going on beneath the Himalayan region, as well as on the surface of the Himalayan region, then we can understand that Himalaya is fully stressed, stressed by convergence, stressed by deformation of the rock, crustal shortening, tectonics, neotectonics, exhumation, or rising of the material from below. And then if we look into surface processes, then we can see that it is undergoing through weathering and precipitation. That precipitation can be high altitude. Snow precipitation can lead to avalanche. And in the lower altitude, you can have rain that can lead to flash floods. And this way, we can see that Himalayan um, is very fragile, fragile and Above all these surface and subsurface processes, there have been another factor that has been stressed too much, which is caused by the present day climate induced phenomena, what we talked about, as well as some sort of man made activities or anthropogenic activities or developmental activities. All these processes are making changes into the Himalayan landscapes and the geomorphology. And these changes are, in fact, control the damage pattern whenever there is an earthquake, there is a landslide, there is an avalanche, there is a glacial lake outburst flood or flash floods or any sort of disaster related phenomena. It is the landscape and the geomorphology of the Himalaya which control the damage pattern. So, as a geoscientist, what we can do? First of all, we are seeing that every year we are having some sort of disasters in the form of some either 
avalanche, landslide, black floods, earthquake, glacial lake, outburst flood, and they are leading to huge loss to the property, structure, lives, livestock. And then prime ministers also in the disaster risk reduction, 10 point agenda if you look into, then main important element or main important feature comes out that we need to build, Professor Nayak Saab also repeatedly says these things at our institute, at many forums, that how we'll be able to build a disaster resilient society? How we'll be able to make a climate adaptable future, not only for us, but for our next generation, for the sustainable development and secure living into the Himalaya and adjoining regions. So we have a Herculean task ahead of us, and we can see that Himalaya as one hand has plethora of resources. And again, all of us know that for the socio-economic cultural growth, we need those resources. On the other hand, we also see that Himalaya has a fragile environment. So how much we should be able to exploit, how much we should be able to utilize for our socio-economic cultural development so that Himalayan ecosystem will not be disturbed. So there lies a big challenge that particular exploitation of the uh, resources as well as uh, conservation and preservation of the ecosystem of the Himalayan region. Professor Nayak has already mentioned that um, climate change is there. And if we look into the Himalayan region, we can evidently see some of the indicators that indicators are glaciers are melting, glacier lakes are being formed, are being expanded. There has been variability in the snow cover, snow depth thinning. And we also have observed upward shift of the tree line. So these indicators are very evident into the Himalaya besides what we observed elsewhere that the sea surface temperature and land surface temperature increasing, sea level rising. So all these phenomena are having a lot of concern about our health, about the people living into the coastal regions, their food security, energy security, water scarcity, as well as we are seeing there have been changes into the biodiversity, land degradation, landslides, avalanches. So I will touch upon three important aspects today because of this much limited time. And I will touch upon one of the important aspects, glaciers and glacier lakes related hazards, and how we'll be able to provide some sort of mitigation measures. These are all natural, these are all phenomena, global phenomena. We cannot stop them, but definitely we can build some sort of measures. We can implement some sort of um, codes by which we'll be able to safeguard the disasters caused by glaciers and glacial lakes. Second important thing I will touch upon on the landslide hazards and its plausible mitigation. And the third important thing is that climate induced flash floods, how they are making impact to us, the lives, structures, properties, livestock, and what are the mitigation measures for that. The first part, the glacier, glacier lakes related geohazards, and what are the way forward? So if we look into the glaciers in the Indian Himalayan region, we have more than 10,000 glaciers that has covered around 37,500 square kilometer area. We have more than 20,000 glacier lakes. And all these lakes and glaciers, they are at the high altitude and the high slope. And because of this potential, because of this gravitational, they can pose threat to the people living into the downstream, to the structure existing into the downstream. So we, we need to understand that what are the way we can look into the health of the glaciers, look into the health of the glacier lakes, so that we can safeguard the people living into the downstream or structures existing into the downstream. Definitely, the glaciers and the snowfields, which are feeding mighty rivers, 
and they are the lifeline to billion of the peoples living in nearby area and elsewhere for their irrigation, drinking water, hydropower generation, domestic usages, industrial usages. And we have also seen that this Indo-Gangetic plain, that area, they are so much uh, important with regard to the agriculture. So if we look into all these phenomena, all these resources into the Himalaya and the water sediment transmit that Himalayan region has attracted people for habitation, for the agroeconomic development, socio-cultural growth. But we see, and we have already mentioned that these glaciers and the glacier lakes at the high altitude pose threat to the people living in the downstream. And in Uttarakhand state itself, we have experienced the biggest disaster we called the tsunami disaster into the Skedarnath 2013 during summer, and which was mainly caused by glacial lake outburst flood, moraine failure, rainfall, and that killed 6,000 people, inundated 5,500 villages, and detained more, like two lakh, more than two lakhs pilgrimages for a few days. Then in 2021, we have seen Dhaliganga, Rishiganga deluge, the Chamoli disaster that took place during winter. And it was caused by huge ice and rock mass avalanche around 27 million cubic meter. And that was caused mainly by the freezing and thawing processes due to the climate change phenomena. And that damaged a lot of bridges, a lot of roads, disconnected villages, damages a lot of hydro projects and killed more than 200 people. Till date, if we go to the hydropower projects, if we talk to the stakeholders, they are in dire need of some sort of system by which they will be able to sustain their projects. They will be able to produce hydropower, whatever they envisage. They still see there are high rate of sediment discharge that can silt the hydro reservoirs or even corrode the turbine blades, which in fact ultimately will um, reduce the lifespan of the turbine or the hydropower generations. The stakeholders are in dire need of some sort of system by which they will be able to um, give some sort of warning for the people working for their project, as well as they can also take precautionary measures to safeguard the health of their project. So we are talking about glaciers and glacier lakes for the benefit of all. Many of you are aware that when you say glacier, what is glacier? Glacier is nothing but a big mass of ice that has been formed by compaction and recrystallization of the snow due to its own weight and which can move downward because of this gravitational force. And any lake which is formed by the glacial activity is called the glacial lake. It is formed mostly at the front, but it can form on either side of the glacier. It can form over the glacier. It can form below the glacier. So different type of glacial lakes and their names have been given depending on the nature of the formation of the lakes. So this is the glaciers and this is the glacial lakes. And we are talking about all these, when you talk about glaciers, they're all high altitude phenomena because the snow, if we want to have, ice you want to have, they should have that temperature, which will be feasible only at the high altitude. But why we are concerned about the formation of the lakes, the glacial lakes? Because let us take one example of the glacial lake into the high altitude. This is some sort of lake. This is a schematic. And in that lake, since we are talking about the Himalaya, Himalaya is seismically, tectonically very active. There can be some sort of tectonic forces. And we are also talking about the climate change, global warming. There will be ice melt. There may be some sort of avalanches. There can be some sort of landslides. And all these phenomena in the lake, if we experience, then that lake can overflow the lake wall can be breached because the lakes into the high altitude are formed by the moraine, loose debris material. They are not very concrete, very solid. 
So, and the capacity of a depression also will be limited. So, when uh, there will be excessive water into that, every chance of breaching the wall, every chance of flowing that lake, and if it happens into that high altitude, it will come down heavily. And on its way, it will pick up a lot of sediments, a lot of other water pockets, and a lot of small plants, etc. And it is, goes down the slope, its momentum will be enhanced. And on its way, whatever it will find, road, bridges, any temples, any villages, it will damage because of this huge momentum of that water flow coming along the slope of the regions. So that glacier lake, if we can monitor, if we can understand what are the status of the lake, and I have already mentioned there are 20,000 lakes, 10,000 glaciers, it is a stupendous task. But we need not bother about all the lakes, we need not bother about all the glaciers. From the satellite data, we can understand the dimension of the lake, we can understand the dimension of the glaciers, only those lakes and glaciers we can take care, which can have some sort of threat to the downstream, where we have a lot of habitation, a lot of infrastructure, etc. So this is the way we should take care about the monitoring part and set up a system of the warning. I'll come back to that. So that before the actual event take place, we can evacuate the people, we can warn the people, we can at least save the people what we are today also experiencing. I'll come back at the end about the Josimor. The structures, the cost of the structures, cost of the properties is not that much compared to the cost of the human life. And we'll be able to save the human life if we have the proper monitoring and proper system for alerting. So I told that it is possible to monitor the health of the lake health of the glaciers. Just to give an one example from the glacier lake and glaciers into the Sikkim Himalaya, done by one of our scientists, Garb, and his team. What we can see that if we look into the glaciers in 1991, 2000, and 2015, you can see what is the fate of the glaciers. And if we look into the glacier lake, then you can see the over the passage of time, it has been expanded. This expansion of the lake at this rate, we need to understand what rate the glaciers are being expanded, at what rate the glaciers are retreating, and based on that, we can assess uh, the, the some sort of threat it can pose or breaching of the lake into the downstream that cause devastations. This is the 2013 Kedarnath worst disaster that we have experienced into the peak summer in June. This is the scenario in the pre-disaster, and we can see the scenario into the post-disaster. So if we really want to understand what exactly is going on to the lake, then we need to establish a network of sensors that can be hydrological stations, that can be meteorological stations, ground penetrating radar, geotechnical investigation, Lake bathymetry, we need to know the volume estimation, inventory, how many lakes are there, and transmission of this data from the field to the processing center online, real time. Data transmission is very, very important. And the data has to be analyzed 24 by 7. And if we want to analyze 24 by 7, all the transmitted data from the field to the central processing station, then we have to reduce the human intervention. We have to reduce the intervention of the human analyst. So the artificial intelligence and machine learning can take over and can do the job around the uh, time 24 by seven, and we can set some sort of threshold. And whenever it shows in from the analysis that it is going to exceed the threshold, it will automatically give the warning and that that warning or alert will be percolated to the administration, to the local people, and, and accordingly will be able to save the lives into that regions. It takes time. It doesn't take place immediately like earthquake. So we have an opportunity, we have a scope to warn the people, to evacuate the people, or if we understand from the monitoring point of view, which are the most threat zone, most risk zone, 
we should not allow exposure into those regions. So there, there will be many ways, not only to give the alert system evacuating people, but before that also, the region, how it will be monitored, how based on the data sets, we'll be able to allow constructions, building code, many other things. So the exposure is very, very important. If there is no exposure into the Himalayan region, every day or every time, every year, sometime is happening, but it, it doesn't cause any damage to the properties, structures, people, live, livestock, then hazards we talk about is not there. They're happening naturally, but in terms of loss of properties, loss of lives, it's not there. So we have to be careful about the exposure to, to the very, very sensitive region, to the very, very vulnerable, very, very susceptible regions, so that we'll be able to safeguard the region from occurring of such phenomena. Another thing, what we have observed in 2021, Rishiganga, Daliganga, I told that at a height of 5,600 meters, a huge ice rock march got detached and fell down at a height of 3,600 meters. And peak winter, February 7. And that impact was so huge that ice got fragmented and melted into water. It created slurry mass. And that slurry mass, when it came down again in the slope region, it was 35 to 40 degree slope region. You can see that created slurry material and went down, it created temporary lakes. And the lake was also threat because the lake generally formed like that. And in course of time, later on, that can pose huge uh, threat into the downstream. And it went down further, damages a lot of DJs, structures, as well as Papuman and uh, near rainy village, there have been two hydropower projects damaged. What we didn't, what we understood from this, that most of the glaciological phenomena we have been monitoring based on the hydrological data by, by setting automatic water level recorder, meteorological data by setting automatic weather stations. But after this event, we had a nearby station, seismic stations at Papawan. And at that seismic stations, we did post-mortem and we found out from the avalanche, from the that um, nuclear zone, nucle from where they got the rock mass uh, detached, and every event damaging to the road, bridges, hydroelectric, all events we have given the name T1, T2, T3, T4, and all have been recorded into the frequency spectrum of the seismogram at Tapu. That was nearly uh, 15 kilometers away from the avalanche site. And it shows that if we have the close network of seismological stations, and if we monitor them continuously in real time, we'll be able to know the entire episode, what exactly happened into the Rishiganga. Later on, if it happens in some regions, we'll be able to understand all these phenomena. These have been published in science, scientific reports. We have done a good amount of work into the regions. Most importantly, what we have observed, again into the post-mortem, before that avalanche took place, two to three hours time, before that we didn't have any sort of tremors or spikes, we could observe a lot of tremors. And this act as a precursory events for the main events. So if we can identify some of the glacierized basin, there if we can establish some of the sensitive sensor like seismometer along with the hydrological stations, meteorological stations, we'll be able to give some sort of warning about the avalanche, about the glacial hazard into that region, what exactly has happened into the Dhaliganga, Rishiganga. And I told, since there are many glaciers, many glacial lakes, we can't monitor each and them. We need to monitor those which may have some lot of impact to the downstream. We need to identify, and that is very possible from the simul sensing data and satellite data. And from our study now onward, after the post-mortem, we, we are going to place two um, areas. One is Rishiganga, Dariganga. Another one is Bhagirathi catchments that a stations having seismological data, meteorological data, 
and hydrological data. And we are trying to transmit this data real time through VSAT or GSM. And we have been able to analyzing this into the a processing center using artificial intelligence and machine learning. At Wadia Institute, we have built a strong group to apply the concept of artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithm. And recently, we have got a book also um, showing the theory and application of different type of algorithms and what type of geoscience problem. This is the first time we are borrowing the concept of the artificial intelligence and machine learning to address different sort of issues what we are facing into the Himalayan region related to the landslides, related to the glaciers, related to the even earthquakes. We, are, we, we, have, we are going to utilize this artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I told that without that, we will not be able to monitor and analyze the data and alert if there is some sort of eventuality going to happen into that place, because this will work 24 by 7. In the rainy village, when we looked into the satellite data, we, we, we observed that in that region, there have been high sediment flash. That has been a concern to the hydroelectric power project stakeholders because that silting and blade corrosion is um, one of the issue. And what we have seen, we are talking even for the um, uh, region, uh, we are talking today, uh, particularly after this Joshimot event. The tow erosion is another important phenomena. During that time, 2021, so much water and debris flew through the Rishiganga River. There have been impact of the tow erosion. You can see the tow cutting. And if there has been tow cutting, tow erosion phenomena, there is every chance of the land gets subsided. This has happened. And still it is happening into the satellite data and into the, uh, into the remote sensing data. We have been observing there have been changes into the landscape and changes into the geomorphological features. So by looking into the satellite and remote sensing data at periodic interval, looking into the changes into the landscape and geomorphology, we, we are monitoring this region and, and we are suspecting and we are seeing, not suspecting, we are seeing that this particular region has developed unstable slope and any moment there can be some sort of landslide. So we have to be careful to take care about this region. There are a lot of houses, but not like houses what we have into the Josimar. But still, it shows some sort of concern and we, we should be able uh, to take precautionary measure if we continually monitor into this region. We have seen the sediment flash into this region. So there is a strong need for the mass movement modeling. There will be debris flow simulation into the laboratory and we have started to do over there. And very recently, uh, we have completed so one of the modeling work of the, that's what Professor Naik Sab was mentioning, of the debris flow modeling. And the debris flow modeling is a very, very important aspect into the Himalayan region, because through the drainage system, through the, um, through the nalas, through the river system, sometimes we get that a sudden increase into the sediment flash. Then we need to understand why that thing is happening what are the possible processes are going on into the Himalayan region, which are responsible for the debris enhancement into the river water or drainage system or nalas. So the debris flow simulation and um, mass movement modeling very, very important. We have done some work into that work in, in that direction. And the dam generation is very, very important. We can have high resolution satellite data. We can have drone-based survey uh, into the region where we need to comprehend some of the processes, we still do not understand clearly. So to comprehend all of them, we need to have different sets of data, whether from the satellite data, whether from the ground-based data, whether by get, getting some sort of geophysical data, hydrological data. So we need to have all sort of data and understand in a comprehensive way what are the processes going on beneath the surface, on the surface, and geomorphological features and the landscapes. So if we have the, the data and the high resolution data today is not an issue, not a problem. Only thing that we have to understand all these processes in a holistic way, in a, based on the data and based on our expertise, whatever we have built in, in over regions. 
So this is in a nutshell what we are telling that if we want to know what is going on in a particular region, and if we want to give some sort of mitigation measure, this is the integrated warning system we should have in place. And if we have the meteorological data, we'll be able to collect all these informations. If we have the hydrological data, we'll be able to have this type of information. And if we have the seismic or GPS data, we'll be having this type of information. Coupled with, if we have the satellite data, multispectral and SAR INSAR data, and the ground-based observations, collectively, if we can analyze and integrate using artificial intelligence and machine learning, that is the way forward for safeguarding the region, for building confidence of the people residing into this region, that we have a system, that system will tell us what exactly we can face or consequence after uh, some time or after a certain period. So this is a very, very important aspects of the development and deployment of the integrated warning system against the glaciers and glacier lake related hazards into these regions. So this is the first part. And the second part, I will cover on the geohazards related to the landslides and its mitigation. If we look into the landslides into the entire world, then we can see 30% of the landslide occur into the Himalaya. And these landslides are mostly caused by natural processes, environmental degradation, anthropogenic activities, or increased urbanizations. And the last two decades, or particularly last few years, we have seen increase into the frequency and intensity of the landslides under the influence of the climate change scenario. And that have been witnessed mostly into the Uttarakhand Himalaya and into the Himachal Pradesh Himalaya. Again, with reference to the landslides in the, in the, in the Uttarakhand state, we can see the 1998 Pitaragar landslide, 2003 Burnabad landslide, 2012 Chamoli landslide. Besides that, the state has experienced tragic landslides in the Kaliasur, the Alaknanda, Malpa in Kali Valley, Natala in Bhagirathi Valley, and Balianala in Nainital is another important issue. What we are, uh, we, we need to understand all these phenomena like Josimot, what we have experienced. And these are the consequences. If there is some sort of landslides, definitely we can see hazards. And these are some of the examples, what we experience in the structures, on properties, on lives, livestock, etc. So when you talk about landslides, what we should do as a geoscientist first? First of all, we need to find out about its landslide susceptibility or vulnerability or risk. This is one of the map I am showing over here in the Bosori town. And that have been generated by looking into several parameters. They are the slopes, gradient, curvature, asperity, direction, elevation, lithology, rock strength, structures, geomorphology, and the land use into that region, open forest area, built up area, and weathering pattern. So if we have all these several parameters, and feed into the artificial intelligence system as input, we'll be able to build the landslide susceptibility map. So map can be prepared by looking into all these parameters. And that's what we have done for the Musori town. And if you look into this map, this map shows the red part has the high risk for the landslide and the green part are the low risk for the landslides. So if we have this type of map, first of all, it will give good information to the city planners, to the city developers, for the development of the green transportation, for the development of the smart cities into that regions. And this will also, also help us to prepare the land use map. So once we have the susceptibility to landslide, vulnerability to the landslide map, that can be converted or translated into land use map. Which part of the Musori town should be used for what purposes? That will be the concept of the land use map. And if we have that land use map, definitely the policymaker will execute policies, what type of building, what type of constructions material they should allow, which part should not be exposed, which part should be exposed. Should be exposed means where we should have some sort of constructions, where we should not have. So various informations we can, we can have once we have this type of map. 
But this map will not tell about the landslide, when landslides will take place. This map will tell the landslide prone zone, highest prone zone, medium prone zone, lowest prone zone. But the landslides is generally triggered by rainfall, by earthquake, by reservoir drawdown, by human intrusion. So we, we, once we know that very highly susceptible landslide zone, and if we do not allow human intrusion, intervention into the region, reserve a drawdown, but earthquake and rainfall is not controlled by us. So there are two separate entity. One is naturally happening. One is at the control of us, anthropogenic or some sort of um, um, man-made. So man-made activities we can stop, but we cannot have any control on the rainfall and earthquake. So for that, what we can do for that, just like Musori map, I am showing another local scale map into the Noinital, uh, Kumayun town, into Bhagirati Valley and the Goriganga. But I must confess, this map has been generated based on certain data and it has to be modified. It has to be checked time to time because there are several other factors have contributed to the landslide which may not be um, included into that or maybe over 10 years time, 15 years time, some more data or some more new parameter have been responsible for the landslides. We have to include them and modify them. So if we want to know the landslide warning, then it is the, the slope instability. However, we say that landslide susceptibility, vulnerability more, that means there is a every chance of falling down. So if we can couple the slope instability with the rainfall threshold, or tectonic movement, or reservoir drawdown, or human intrusion. Anyway, reservoir drawdown and human in intervention, these two factors can be taken care. Once we know this region is very, very vulnerable, we should not allow a activities related to the human intrusion or reservoir drawdown. But if we can, if we can couple the slope instability with the rainfall threshold and tectonic movement, that will help us to forward landslide. Um, landslide into that regions. So for the forewarning of the landslide, we need to have a web-based monitoring system by placing sensors like rain gauge, piezometer, inclinometer, extensionometer, total stations, insects. So a lot of stations, if we can place into the highly vulnerable zone, and if we can monitor the data at the processing center, like Wadi Institute of Himalayan Geology, and if we can understand the threshold, that if it exceeds the threshold, we'll be able to forward the landslide into that particular regions. So this is the concept of what we are going to build uh, into the regions. So what I told into that region, suppose we have got some region is vulnerable, and this is one of the success story done by Wadia Institute of Himalayan Geology in Varnabat Parbat Uttarkasi. And this particular region, when we based on the map, we declared that highly susceptible, then to protect the region, we can have two types of mitigation measures. One is the structural measure, one is the non-structural measure. In the structural measure, that's what we have done. We can see that we can create some dead wall, we can retain some wire mesh, short creek, inserting nails, soil nails, rock bolts, so that the slope movement can be arrested. In the non-structural, since we know the region is vulnerable to landslides, we should not allow constructions any sort of building. That, that, that exposure should not be there. We have to follow certain, even if we make some, we have to follow certain building codes. Sensitization to the local people is very, very important. They should know that what they should do into that region, what they should not do into that region. So this is some sort of way uh, we can do towards the mitigation of the landslides, understanding the landslide susceptibility, and constantly monitoring into that regions. The third part and the last part, during the last one year data I'll be showing over you, or maybe two years data, and you can see that excessive rainfall and excessive snowfall have made some sort of disaster. And we have learned some of the lessons. Still we are learning. There is no end of learning. And some of the examples I'm showing into these regions, and you can see 
the Indian Himalayan region, what we are talking today, they are experiencing cloud bursts, flash floods, landslides, debris flow, ice dam uh, surge, glove, ice rock avalanche. And if you look into along the altitude of the Himalaya, you can see a lot of different type of phenomena. When you talk about such ice dam, they are taking place mostly into the very high altitude regions into this into this into this Indian Himalayan regions. Just to give you an example, that last year, October 2022, we have observed episodic avalanche into the Kedarnath Temple town. And if you look into the structures, if you look into the landscapes and their geomorphology, and from there, it is evident into that region that if there is excessive snowfall, that will cause some sort of avalanche. So to, to give a measure of the landslide uh, avalanche or to avoid the impact of the uh, impact of the Aval uh, uh, snow avalanche into this region, we have to take actions. And you see that the slope, what exactly happened into these regions, I'm not going to explain all these phenomena at this moment, but my concern is to show that episodic snow avalanche into the Kedarnath Temple town has taken place and the structure, the, the geology, the landscape into the region has a very important role to play for that. Second important example I am showing that exactly happened in the September 22 Dharchula in Pithoraga town. There also you can see there have been cloud bursts. So there has been some sort of confusion. What is the cloud burst? What is the heavy rain? Generally, whenever there is a heavy rain more than 100 millimeter per hour, we define as a cloud burst. The suddenly so much huge rain it takes place into that region. And we, we have seen it has caused the devastations flood into that regions, particularly Kotila village in Indian side. There have been some sort of disaster into the Nepal side also. This is in the Nepal and Indian border. So we can see that under the influence of the climate change, when there have been cloud burst, when there have been heavy rainfall, the situation or the, the, the geography or the landscape or the geology or the tectonic is such that it leads to some sort of flash floods. Is to. So we are not prepared. We have constructed some sort of buildings without understanding, much understanding. We know some of the things, but we need to comprehend further. We need to build so that we'll be able to have some sort of resilience whenever such, um, such a phenomena takes place into that region. This is another example in Dehradun, 20th August in Maldepta. We visited that place. Chief Minister was also there with, and he called a meeting. We all scientists visited that place. What exactly happened into this region even that the heavy rainfall and, and there have been some sort of slope instability into that region and the river flooded and it inundated on either sides. There are the hotels. There were some sort of uh, shops on either side when flood took place. It, it, it all got uh, submerged into that and some people died. They are not prepared. And particularly if it happens at night when people sleep, the devastation becomes more. There is no scope for the people to escape that particular natural phenomena exactly happened into these regions. So we have mentioned all these phenomena. We have understood the several causes, what exactly happening in different parts of our uh, country, in different parts of the Himal Indian Himalayan region. This is another important phenomena we have observed in Amarnath Holy Clay, the rain triggered. And in the Amarnath Holy Clay, you can, you can see that flash floods and there are some sort of uh, uh, tents, et cetera, and people go to the villages and the so huge rainfall, there was not proper drainage system. The constriction of the drainage made the uh, flash flood into this region. So heavy rain could not be flashed out immediately and led to the flash floods into that regions. And so we have to prepare nowadays in the present climate change scenario, we need to look into all these aspects seriously and go ahead with some sort of whatever activities we do, either pilgrimage point of view, whether uh, any uh, development point of view, whether any strategic point of view, whether anything, if we do scientifically, I think we will be able to sustain that impact 
will be able to um, we will be able to um, uh, create some sort of situation so that we will not face that type of consequences what we are facing at different places uh, during uh, the avalanches during the flash floods uh, during the um, uh, during the uh, landslides in different parts and we can see that different type of rock formations they are also not uh, suitable for different purposes in Another important thing we have observed in Otolakuri avalanche in Hemkun side, a lot of pilgrimage in good faith. You see that this much snow and the people are going in the faith of their religion. And you can see the slope and you can see what exactly happened into that. That also we have, uh, we have uh, reported into the, all this work, whatever has happened during the last uh, 22, we have uh, reported just to disseminate this information for the masses for the policymakers to take precautionary decisions. And we have also recommended that instead of going like this, they can have some sort of ropeway. But for the constructions of the ropeway also, we need to have some sort of scientific investigations. We need to find out that pillars, whatever will be built on the, uh, for the uh, ropeway, uh, we, we, we should have the solid foundation. Otherwise, that will also have some sort of impact. So there are several phenomena we are observing, we are seeing happening particularly in the Uttarakhand state under the influence of the climate change. This is another important thing we have observed in the Himachal Pradesh, Baksu, Nala, or Macleod Ganj. And these devastations also we have seen, there have been constrictions of the uh, uh, drainage systems. So huge rain, whenever it fell down into that region, it could not be flushed out immediately. It in fact inundated and cause damages to the property, structures, lives, etc. And Rishi Ganga, Dali Ganga, also we attribute, along with different other factors, some of the factor related to the climate change. Because we, we found that huge rock mass got detached from that high altitude, 5,600 meters. And the rock mass was garnet, mica, micacea, squarjite, cyst, and that has gone over a period of time through the process called freezing and thawing. And that has developed a lot of traverses that has developed some sort of cracks, weakness. And when there was a heavy snow accumulation into that region, February 5th and 4th by IMD report. And the cumulatively, the weathering formation of the development of the crevices as well as the snowfall could not sustain that load and that huge rock mass, 27 million cubic meter, fell down along the 40 degree slope, and it is called wedge failure. So this, this wedge, when it came down heavily and fell down, broken into pieces, formed the slurry material, and on its way, it picked up earlier dead, dead ice and debris, water pockets, and then created huge momentum as it went down and down and created all sorts of devastation we have experienced into the regions. And this is another sort of example we have seen into the Uttarkasi uh, 20, 2019. This was before the cloud burst and situation after the cloud burst. So if we look into this climate change, as Professor Nayak Saad has rightly pointed out, this climate change is global phenomenon. But the impact, what we are experiencing, the region, the people staying, habiting, habitating into that regions. So impact on the local, impact is taking place on the local, the phenomena is the global, and all of us know the main causes of the climate change is the global warming. And again, in even declaration that 198 countries all took oath that by 2050, they'll make a carbon neutrality and 2070 net zero carbon, because they are telling the main important factor, which is responsible for the Global warming is the greenhouse gas emissions, mostly coming from the fossil fuels. The greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, methane, NOx, SO2. As well as there are some sort of impacts uh, taking place to the global warming is the biomass burning and forest fires. There have been aerosols, metal dust, particulate matter into the atmosphere, black carbon. As well as the way the cities are getting developed, a lot of materials are being used for the development of the cities. And the urban heating is another important factor to the global warming and particularly the climate change. So for anything, if we want to give some remedial measure, we need to understand 
the basic we need to understand the root causes and if we want to give some sort of mitigation measures then we have to take action on the root causes that's why this event has taken action on that carbon mitigation they are telling that we have to go for renewable or green energy but the need of the energy which is the driver for the economy for any country and if we can make some sort of affordable and reliable renewable and green energy resource as an alternate energy resource against the fossil fuels will be happy but let us see what is the status of making a renaissance or making a breakthrough into renewable or green energy sector the second important thing we can do we can gradually transit to the low carbon emitted or environment friendly energy supply so if we can do that our job of the climate change our job to the mitigation of the global warming will be done and we will be able to have less impact due to the climate change is it possible or not so there is a huge challenge huge scopes lies over there if we look into the energy scenario of our country then and why we are talking too much about the energy because energy is the driver for the economic development without energy we 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 are stand still we can't move at all so how will we be able to meet the huge energy requirement the global energy requirement our domestic or indian energy requirement we produce only 30% of our requirements and in the global scenario we are talking about that as an alternative we should have a green energy or a set of green energy or some sort of renewable energy but if you look into the scenario we can see that there has not been any breakthrough into the global energy sector during the last few decades we are able to meet the global energy requirement by hydroelectricity only 6 percentage by renewable energy only 5 percentage by uh, nuclear energy into 4.5 percentage till date the 80 percentage world energy requirement is made by fossil fuels and in 2021 international energy agency they reported that fossil fuels will remain for next few decades so when we are talking about fossil fuels what are the fossil fuels which are meeting the energy requirement it is the oil which is meeting 33.1 percentage energy requirement coal 27 percentage natural gas 24.2 percentage and in our country we have not been able to make any major discovery of conventional oil and gas fields and we need to explore hydrocarbons into the difficult terrains like fast fold belt into himalayan region subvolcanic sediments deep waters gas hydrates shale gas shale oil coal bed methane are considered major unconventional energy resources but we need to make a breakthrough into their technological advancement technological development so that we will be able to produce them in an environmentally safe and economically viable manner so if the situation what international energy agency is telling that next few decades we have to depend on the fossil fuels and we know the fossil fuels will generate the greenhouse gas then in that case what are other ways there is other scopes and other ways also if we cannot make any breakthrough into the green energy we have to depend only on the fossil fuels then we can have some sort of strategy and people are working into that direction and if it happens then we need not bother about the use of fossil fuels what are those challenges what are those issues of mitigation measures first of all all of us know that carbon dioxide is produced from two sources one is static source where there are some sort of processing units there are household people are producing carbon dioxide another one is the dynamic sources the transportation so we have to efficiently capture the carbon either by hydration or absorption or adsorption or some sort of innovative way efficiently if we can capture the carbon from those static and dynamic sources and then convert it into usable products or processes based on ccus carbon capture utilization sequestration that will be the ideal so we need to have some sort of innovation 
by which we will be able to convert the carbon dioxide into carbonate. Some sort of agency catalyst we require so that we can convert that carbon dioxide, even in situ, into carbonate. And if we can have carbonate, that carbonate can be utilized for several purposes. That can be used for the drugs, glass, pulp, pharmaceutical, water softener, even clay, cement, several purposes. Even we can convert the carbon dioxide into methanol and its derivative. And that can be utilized for the synthetic fabrics or some sort of, you can say, paints, or maybe um, you, you can use for pharmaceutical agro, agrochemicals. Several purposes, the methanol can be used and its derivative. And third important thing that if you can efficiently capture them, you can geologically sequester into a host formations which can be depleted oil and gas fill, which can be some sort of coal, deep coal seams. It can be some sort of subvolcanic or subbasalt sediments, suboceanic sediments. So there, if you can sequester, then carbon dioxide will retain there. And it has been found out by experiment that million years that carbon dioxide can sit, can occupy uh, in the form of geological sequestrations into that regions. Fourth important thing we can do, there are a lot of heavy oil fields. So for the production of the enhanced oil recovery, we, we can use carbon dioxide for flooding purposes, as well as we have seen that in India, we have huge amount of gas hydrate into the offshore. The amount is so huge that only 10% production can meet our energy requirement for 100 years. And for that production purposes, the carbon dioxide substitution or molecular substitution of methane, that, that gas hydrate, what I'm talking about, mostly consisting of methane, 99.9 percentage .9 methane. There can be molecular substitution of the methane by carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide hydrate will be formed and methane will be re released. So there is a production uh, of the methane from the gas hydrate reservoir by, by, by um, injecting carbon dioxide into the reservoir and forming the carbon. So it will help two purposes. Once it will help develop the production technology for the um, carbon um, uh, gas hydrate, as well as it will sequester the carbon dioxide into the ground. So another important thing, what I told as a mitigation measure towards the climate change, that we have to slowly move to the transition or the mixed energy basket. What is that? Is that particularly if we look into India, India has a varied geographical locations, landscapes. If you look into north, we have lofty Himalaya. If you look into the coastal side, western and western margin, we have abundant wind, wind and sunshine. We have mixed coal bearing and gas rich sedimentary basins. We have agricultural dominated ecosystem in the rural area. We have industry dominated urban system, urban ecosystem. So we can have different type of requirement of the energy in different part of the country. And that offers a great opportunity to move towards the mixed energy in the low carbon environment friendly scenario as a measure to mitigate the carbon dioxide or climate change. Therefore, we have to look for the development of the hybrid technology, mostly with two or more energy resources that can be solar, wind, geothermal, or ocean energy, and that is the future of the energy security of our country. And we have a unique place, unique geographical locations, unique landscapes, unique requirement of different sets of energy availability and different sets of energy requirement in the form of agricultural dominated rural sector and the industry dominated urban sector. So the last slides, whatever I talked about that understanding or comprehending different processes going on for uh, the um, hazards into the Himalayan region and providing some sort of mitigation measure, it is very possible to develop the integrated warning system because we have a very dense coverage of network of different sets of sensors for the landslides, for the avalanches, as well as we have for the earthquakes. And we have very fast computing machines. We have advanced modeling. We have artificial intelligence and machine learning. So it is possible to develop certain system so that we can safeguard 
against tragic events what we are experiencing today into the Himalayan region. And if we can have this type of establishment and the network at one region and slowly in various catchments and various basins, we can deploy and develop and one by one, we'll be able to safeguard different states. And if we have different states, different responsibility, particularly what is happening into their state and integrating them through a centralized mechanism to, over, to oversee what exactly happening in different state, we'll be able to build what we told in the first slide, a disaster resilient and climate adaptable future for our next generation, for a, having a secured and safe um, uh, life into the Himalaya and adjoining regions. Thank you very much for your patient listening. And uh, now I think I can take up some of the questions um, in this important topic. I must thank my students and several colleagues who have contributed tremendously to achieve several aspects of the and just comprehending geohazards into the Himalaya and giving some sort of mitigation measures. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. It was mind blowing lecture. Beautiful lecture. And uh, I haven't heard such a lecture on Himalayas and the resident issue as, as yet. Even though I had attended two years of training at, one year of training at Masuri. So uh, uh, there are so many questions that can be asked. So I wouldn't do that myself. So let others, let others yeah. do it and I'll come back so later. There is one in the yeah. chat box and Professor Aluwalia yeah. is raising his hand. Yeah. So can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Arun first. Yeah. Okay, good. So first of all, uh, it was one of, again, I would say that uh, thank you for giving such a wonderful lecture, informing and educating all of us about so many important things. Uh, I don't have a question, but I just want to make an intervention, uh, which is uh, in some sense complementary and in a slightly different direction, because such a focused discussion has happened on Himalaya environment and so on. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, uh, the economic model that we are following today is of exponential growth. And I think uh, a large number of uh, people uh, do not understand the, the way an exponential function actually grows. And it can overtake almost everything. So uh, as long as we do not invent, a, and this economic model was uh, valid, in the infinite resource hypothesis. If the natural resources are infinite, such a model would work. That was maybe true approximation, correct approximation 300 years ago, 200 years ago, maybe 150 years ago. But now we very much know the finiteness of resources. Therefore, we need to fundamentally question the exponential growth models wherever they are being applied. We have already seen how population has grown exponentially. Profits can also not grow exponentially. That is the point I wanted to make to say that uh, the anthropogenic causes for environmental destruction, whether it is Himalayas or rest of the earth, uh, are very much associated with this uh, unsustainable model of economic growth. I just wanted to make this intervention and leave it at that. Thank you. May I? Yeah. Would you like to respond? Uh, yeah, I, I just. Okay, yeah, could I just okay. add? Yeah, uh, okay then. Uh, Professor Arundeep Aluwalia, could I, could we please Sa have your remarks? Dr. Dr. Sai, Mike, uh, I have got a, a one question. How will the geologist and geological opinion become most important in urbanization of the Himalayas. Geological reports of 1980 and geological uh, report of 1976 for Kedarnath and Joshimat. Were there, they, were, they could provide a complete solution, uh, avoid all the havoc uh, which happened, but they were dumped. The urbanization in the channels uh, was uh, advised not to be there, it's still there. And the traditional architecture of the hills was lighter and greener. Instead, we are having the same method of construction in Himalayas, also higher Himalayas, what we have in Gurgaon. The hills uh, ecosystem architecturally has to be restored. Otherwise, oh, this great lecture 
and uh, this great talk uh, would go waste unless geologists are given bigger say and geologists are taken more seriously and engineers don't overrule them. At the moment, we are engineering disasters in the Himalayas. We're obliterating the Himalayas through engineering projects. We better come to the status quo. We better hold and sit and stare for a while and let a peace uh, prevail in the environment. Definitely what you told, and we understand that uh, when once we have that um, fragile ecosystem in the Himalaya, uh, we had to have geoscientific investigation and a recommendation given by the geoscientist, as a whole I'm telling, before taking up any sort of project which may hamper or disturb the ecosystem of the Himalaya. So that has to be done and it is there already every time it is taken the opinion. But after that, uh, I cannot comment anything on those issues. So it is a very, very important uh, issue that geoscience is playing role, will play a role, and they will give their advices, suggestions, recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, there has been this question in the chat box for a while. This is by B. Sudarshan Patro. Mr. Patro, would you like to ask the question yourself? Or I will read it out. Very interesting session, sir, and in informative. Please highlight on, number one, is it possible ways to predict cloudburst events prior some one days or couple of hours before? Number two, for this, observational methods required. Number three, what are the phenomenon before occurrences of cloud burst? So there, there are three questions. Possible to predict, observational methods, and what are the phenomenon before occurrence of cloud burst? Yeah, this is a very important uh, question. Uh, but honestly, I am not an expert uh, working into that area. And I told that information we gathered on the rainfall or any cloud burst related, the IMD is the authoritative organization and work, people working into that organization will be the right person to give the right answer to this question. So we, we have talked about the issues, what we are facing as a geoscientist and understanding all these things, but prediction of the cloud burst, prediction, what type of, uh, um, uh, sensors will establish how you'll be able to do that. This is not the given of my expertise. Maybe in the audience, somebody else uh, has done some work into that direction, will be the right person to answer the question. Thank you, sir. Anybody else who would like to talk on this <laughs> issue? Cloudburst. May I intervene with this? Uh... Oh, please, please, sir. Yeah, yeah I think. Uh... See, the extreme uh, events have been uh, predicted well, but you know, the cloud burst had a certain definite definition. So that may, may not be possible, but the extreme events are now able to predict. And that is why the radars are being placed, uh, especially in Himalaya, which would be extremely useful to give predictions about the extreme rainfalls. It becomes cloud burst in a very specific condition, so we will not get it. But extreme uh, with the uh, radars, once the entire area is covered, I think it should be visible. Thank you. So if there is no other questions, Mr. Dharamveer would like to. Okay, yeah, please go ahead, please. So I would like to make a suggestion to the director Odia Institute. So you require a lot of workforce to do monitoring data on a real time basis. See, and that kind of a huge workforce, prima facie, cannot come from your own institute because, you know, it's just this thing. So, can in the backdrop of what all you have stated, and the humongous huge task which is there at your hand. So can a initiative be conceived that the science graduates, 
you know, could be belonging to different sciences, whom one could train and employ as volunteers for your mission. Okay, on a six months to a one, one year basis. Some, there has to be a minimum duration because people have to be trained to do that kind of a, this thing. So in a mission mode, you know, can a huge campaign be conceived in which maybe at any instance of time, several hundred young people from different universities can be invited to participate under the overall supervision of a national institute like Wadia Institute of Himalayan Geology. This will give you a requisite workforce and this will also give these people a real time training of where their talents can be utilized. So it's a kind of a you know, Himalayan Seva or Himalayan Kar Seva, but by trained and educated youth of the country. This and is maybe, like a maybe, science model. Yeah, maybe the Ministry of Earth Sciences, you know, because a disaster finally affects everybody. So do you think such a thing is possible? And uh, as a part of several newer initiatives that are being, you know, DST invites to give us suggestions. So in the so-called your initiatives in the brand of Amrit Kaal, can something, some campaign be thought and be run for a period of five to 10 years? Because it's not a one or two years business because the task is really huge. Even if it is taken as a mission, which is on a long-term sustenance, 10 year, 20 years mission, till we have exhausted the whole thing. Could I make any sense, Dr. Kalachan's sign? Yes, yes. What you raised, it is need of the hour and it is very, very important. Uh, only thing that our um, uh, scientific think tank and um, other uh, policy makers, um, because you yourself also mentioned, I also mentioned, it is a huge task. And because of the huge task, we cannot leave it as it is. We have to identify most potential areas which can have some sort of threat instead of uh, covering the entire Himalayan region. Particularly, we are seeing that uh, Uttarakhand state is one of the state into the Indian Himalayan region, which have been affected most either by landslides or some sort mm -hmm. of um, avalanches or mm -hmm. flash floods. Mm -hmm. So we can have, mm -hmm. and since Wadia is here, we are trying to do best in those directions. Sensitizing the people is also very important. And uh, taking up different sorts of projects also need a lot of infrastructure, a lot of human resources, which we lack. And I think uh, when we have a specified ministry, Ministry of Earth Science, under the leadership of Professor Silas Nayak, and now the Secretary, Dr. Ravi Chandran, and several other institutes under the uh, Ministry of Earth Science, as well as some of the geoscience-related institutes, uh, it is possible. Uh, only thing that has to be monitored, that has to be guided by one centralized agency, uh, that Indian Himalayan uh, Council-like uh, thing uh, or, or body, because otherwise, again, it will be done in silo and will not be able to disseminate the information from one place to other, one state to other state. So it needs a different type of think tank. I, I am not able to uh, give complete um, uh, some sort of uh, idea in that direction, how you'll be able to achieve that. But it is possible and it is need of the hour. It is very, very, because the geohazards phenomena we will be experiencing and in the coming years, it will be much more uh, as per we are envisaging in the present climate change scenario, and, and its impact to the landslides and avalanches taking place. So because, you know, the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor only last week has uh, asked the uh, Punjab University and the IIT Roper to provide leadership to the creation of a Northwest cluster, which comprises all the states of Northwest, whether it is Jammu, Kashmir, Ladakh, Uttarakhand, 
Punjab, Hima, Himachal Pradesh. So, you know, so the, some entity is being created, okay? And two major institutions are being asked to shoulder the leadership responsibility, Punjab University and IIT Rohpur, okay? There is already a DST project on water, land, and so on, uh, which is centered at uh, IIT Rohpur in the form of Avad. Okay, so there is a cent center for advanced study in geology at Punjab University, Wadia Institute is there. Then there in, um, in Himachal, uh, there is this private university, Shulani University, which is taking this issues which are related to the Himalayan region in, in, in Himachal Pradesh. So, you know, so, so this network of thing is there. So if the uh, nationals, a DST institute like yours, which is recognized national institute and which has the requisite expertise. You may not have a large number of people, but you do have some 40, 50 scientists uh, who can conceive this overall program. And a society like ours, SPSTI, which has retired people from different institutions, we could help you to, you know, once you conceive it, we can help you to see how to get you uh, young people be, being plugged into it. I mean, SPSTI is today running things in partnership with uh, India's Indian National Young Ac Academy of Sciences. So we have these young scientists who are young faculty members in these things. So their students can form, they are passing out students can form this thing. So we could run some kind of, uh, you know, some filter, which kind of students to take it and give them some gainful scholarship for a year or two and get them into a mission. So this way they get, a, they get a real time experience of participating in a national mission where their knowledge and their expertise also will, I mean, if you have a physicist, chemist, geologist, maybe engineers who are into much into technology, who can understand the basics, of what is to be done, how the data is to be collected, how it has to be uh, logged in, and maybe part some of the brighter people can even participate in that analysis and so on and so forth. So it can be a national mission for the, this thing. And you can set an example. You know, these things will not come from the Department of Bureaucrats in Department of Science and Technology, but if it evolves from the bottom, then we can lobby for a resource uh, to make a difference. So if your lecture and Professor Salation, Nayak's earlier lecture and his association with us and his reach and his articulation on behalf of all of us at the right places, maybe a, a new initiative we can evolve. So I would like to plead to you to maybe have you come over to Chandigarh and give a lecture in a physical mode in the form of a colloquium at Punjab University campus where the students have an opportunity to listen to you directly. Because today on our forum, there are only senior scientists. So your lecture, even if I appeal to the students to listen to it, it, it is not an alternative to your physically coming and say giving a lecture, uh, which is organized by Depart Center for Advanced Study in Geology, I mean with Patnaik and Parampreet, if they can take initiative of organizing a lecture with a larger purpose of seeing whether we can entice the young people to participate in such a mission. So if you could. Uh, uh, sir, sir, uh, as long as um, percolation of this information to the young people, motivating them uh, through some uh, offline lectures, uh, through some uh, short courses is not a problem at all. I will be very happy to do that, not only to Punjab University, any other Himalayan states, so that um, we can bring to the notice of the young people that what are the opportunities and scopes we have and what are the climate change induced phenomena, what are the natural phenomena we are experiencing, for that, what way we can contribute something so that we ultimately give benefit to the society because Anything uh, research or science we do, if it doesn't have any bearing on the societal implications or, or addressing some big science questions will not have any value. So according to me, uh, your suggestions uh, I am taking 
and I and my some colleagues uh, will uh, deliver some of the physical talks or uh, as well as arrange some of the short courses as well as uh, for the capacity building, uh, what type of instruments we use, uh, what are the basic principles of the instruments and how we'll be able to do all sort of things we can pass on. This, this will be, this is also one sort of routine of our institutional activities as a uh, awareness program. Uh, and uh, for earthquake purpose also, we do some sort of mock drilling, et cetera. So we'll be doing that. We'll be very happy to do that. That is no issue at all. Other thing in a big way, uh, that um, how we'll be able to in the, in the 30, 40 years or 20 years, 10 years time, I'll be able to uh, contribute uh, towards the science uh, comprehending different uh, geohazards in, in, because not only the geohazards we are talking, we, we have a lot of, you also rightly said that Himalayan region, the big water says, and uh, the water said its implications, that it itself is a huge topic. And then uh, each and every component of the geohazard is a huge topic. So we we can do as as much as possible from Wadia as well as uh, from my personal behalf. I'll be very happy to do that on three accounts: that uh, physical talk, no problem, and short course arrang arranging short course on different aspects on the new tools, and as well as um, uh, sensitizing to the people and encouraging to the students, telling what are the scopes opportunities we have in the earth science, geoscience so that geoscience can play a pivotal role. And then fourth uh, paradigm is that we have to bring other disciplines also, because we are talking only the science, there will be technological aspects, how we'll be able to build any sort of uh, either constructions or any sort of developmental activities, or even if we exploit any uh, resources from the Himalaya, what are the best way uh, without um, disturbing the Himalayan ecosystem, we'll be able to utilize for our socioeconomic development. We will do that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, Professor Patnaik from Department of Geology, whether you would like to add something, Parampit, would you like to add something? So, if there is no one to make any comment or add any other information or ask question. Before I formally thank uh, 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 while I was listening to a lecture, my memory, I went back into time into 1973 when I had joined the service and I was under training at Masuri. So part of the Masuri curriculum was tracking to two destinations in the hilly areas and the two uh, types of courses. So I went to, the first was I went to Gomuk. We, a large number of, about 50 of us went to Gomuk. And it had opened up and we were being uh, helped by the border security force uh, who were helping us to take and uh, take down uh, through the hilly areas, very narrow tracks. And since then, the traffic has been increasing. Now the road infrastructure to Yamuna 3, Gangotri and many such destinations have become quite popular. So with that, several environmental changes must have taken place, which you also referred to, human intervention. Now the issue is, how to handle it. Second is the defense. All these areas are very critical from the defense point of view. How army can go from one place to another. So it also leads to some kind of intervention into the, the climate there. Third issue is, how do we control the economic development. If we look at, I mean, how to balance economic development and en environmental protection. So I would be grateful if you could comment on these issues, these points, defense, environment, uh, the development, and third is the, the human intervention from outside. 
Oscar, you are asking me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, again, again, I may not be a uh, full fledged expert uh, to give answer um, to this uh, important, very, very important, I'll not say important, very, very important issue of balancing between the economy and ecology. And uh, definitely from the geoscientific input, we'll be able to provide that um, what sort of um, activities towards the development, what sort of um, um, structures toward the development um, should be done so that uh, it can sustain uh, the impact of that uh, into that area. So that impact assessment study, uh, geologically, geophysically, we can provide, but uh, that doesn't mean that we'll be able to say towards the socioeconomic development, there should be some sort of other um, um, persons who has expertise into that area. And then if we have a one-to-one -one sitting and understand that what are the geological, geophysical, geoscientific implications if we do that type of project, and then what are the economic um, development if we have, if we do not have, or if we have low magnitude, high magnitude, highest magnitude. So for that, um, it cannot be done in one word uh, by sitting over here. We have to see site to site. We have to see place to place. What type of economic benefit we can uh, we can uh, accrue, and what type of uh, society, uh, what type of uh, impact uh, we can have if we have that type of things. So this is also site specific, uh, geology and tectonic area specific. So unless we have the discussion into those areas in, in a holistic manner about structures, geology, tectonics, everything together. Uh, then only we'll be able to give some sort of suggestions into that direction. But definitely, uh, there has to be a balance between economy and economy, eco ecology. Without understanding the impact of the uh, impact of that area, uh, if we do on any sort of developmental activities, it it can it should it should not be done. And generally, uh, based on that recommendation, based on that assessment only, uh, we should go ahead with any sort of developmental activity. Okay. Now. So, uh, so the, the next uh, comment that uh, I would like to have from you, what is happening in China, Burma, across the border, that whatever activities they are indulging in also make impact on our country, if not defense from defense point of view, but from climate point of view. Are we monitoring that? You see, the, this is also a very important uh, discussion, and I think uh, <laughs> with the permission of Professor Nayak, I can tell his name, that uh, the transboundary uh, research, transboundary uh, some sort of discussion is also very much uh, required in the present climate change scenario. Only working by the scientists, uh, by the Indian uh, group, and uh, without involving in the, what very rightly told in the Himalayan region, we are talking only about the Indian Himalayan region, but there is some sort of concern uh, bringing them into the platform and make some sort of transdisciplinary uh, understanding what exactly happening their side, what exactly happening this side, and how we'll be able to uh, do their action. And if you do, if it, if they do their activities in those areas, maybe our area will be safeguarded. So there are a lot of issues, a lot of things are there, not only on the river issues, not only on the uh, this um, uh, glacier issues or um, um, the st strategic point of view. There are several scientific issues uh, we should uh, have uh, a discussion at a common platform. So do, do you think there is, uh, is this included in the regional conferences of the nations, Southeast uh, countries or Asian countries? I've, I'm not sure. Does it form a part of agenda whenever Asian Development Bank meets or the countries meet the Asian countries, mainly China, India, and other South. Uh, <coughs> South Second issue is, what is the role of Russians? Because they also occupy, they, they also share the boundary with the Himalayas. Yeah, the same thing. I, I, I didn't mention any country's name. What I said that uh, the countries sharing uh, that uh, particularly Himalaya, uh, when you talk about uh, safeguarding of the Himalaya, that all the countries uh, sharing the part uh, into Himalaya uh, should also discuss some of the issues so that uh, the hazards or that the climate change issues, whatever being affected in one country, it is not limited to that country only, it is limited to the entire region. So 
I am not specifically telling what Russia should do, China, and I am again not the right person again uh, to speak out <laughs> no, no. this forum uh, about all this. Uh, maybe there are many other distinguished um, fellows and uh, members. Uh, they have much experience uh, into those aspects, so I think they can also share their opinion into this forum. May I add something? Yes. Please, please go. Uh, I'm Ravindra. Uh, in fact, this uh, the last part of the discussion that has been raised is uh, opened me to add something. Uh, quite some years back, uh, we had a working paper uh, on Himalayas on the line of the Arctic Council. As most of the participants must be knowing that the Arctic Council comprises of the Arctic countries, uh, the seven or eight countries which share the Arctic region. There was a proposal that the Himalayas, since it, this also involves uh, several of the countries, so those uh, countries should come together and form a sort of a council on the line of the Arctic Council and do some sort of a developmental activities that could take uh, the science, uh, the geopolitics, the economic development, the ecology, everything together. So uh, I think uh, subsequently that was diluted and the Himalayan Science Council was constituted, removing the external parts, the China and Pakistan, uh, possibly the reasoning was that the, uh, the some, some of the crucial data on the water flows of the rivers and all that could not be shared. So uh, the council got restricted only to the Indian part. And most of these states uh, which, uh, which have the Himalayas, like Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, uh, and other areas, they were included, uh, possibly under the uh, chief secretaries of the different states. I, I'm not aware what happened to that. Possibly Dr. Nayak must be aware. Uh, because he was one of the founders of the... Uh, Himalayan Council. Can we have some uh, light on that, sir? Yeah, actually, it has been formed under the state. And uh, unfortunately, after it was formed, two years of COVID came and nothing much has moved. But I think uh, it is already there. Uh, sooner or later, I think uh, it become active because as far as India is concerned, at the highest level, uh, there is a complete understanding that we need this uh, understanding with the neighboring countries about the Himalaya. So that is, uh, I mean, as a principle, this has been accepted, uh, but it is not active as of now. I think they need to be more active in this area. Thank you. Um, before closing, I would like to read out a remark by Professor Jasdeet Singh Bagla of ISIL. Mm -hmm. Professor Bagla says, unplanned urbanization in the Himalayas has been going on and is evident to everyone. In spite of many disasters that you have enumerated in the talk, there appears to be no change in terms of regulation of construction and implementation of existing rules and regulations. What do you think it will take for a change of mindset? Yeah, Professor Kent also wanted to add something. Yes. Go uh, ahead, Professor Ken. It has been a wonderful lecture. A lot of uh, information, yes. you know, basic information. For instance, uh, there's no contraction of the land of the order of few millimeters per year and extension in, uh, you see, Tibet and all that. It has been an interesting lecture. Thanks, Professor uh, Karachanji. And uh, in fact, the uh, remark I want to make is in connection with what uh, Sri Dharmvir said, a, some kind of a uh, balance between economic development and environmental issues. It so happens that uh, we have been encroaching upon the nature's right to have its way. See, even in uh, you see uh, urban areas, people have created land on uh, wet mass lakes and all that, and built uh, housing with the results floods are coming there. Likewise, we have encroached upon the passage of rivers in uh, uh, Himalayas and hilly regions. There's a need, finally, I would say, finally, there's a need to live in harmony with nature. Thanks, sir. Live in harmony with nature. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, we can close now. Yeah, we can now close. Would you like to say a formal note of thanks? No, it's a privilege to uh, thank you, Professor Kalachanji, for such an illuminating, informative, 
and very, very, uh, I would say, uh, uh, enlightening talk. I never heard, never knew many things which you mentioned during the lecture. And surely, as the uh, situation has improved, we start. Uh, we will start looking at physical lectures at Chandigarh, Gurgaon, and few other places. So, if you happen to travel to this side, please do let us know. So we'd be happy to have you either at Faridabad, Gurgaon, Chandigarh for a lecture and interaction with our school children, college students, etc. I'll be grateful and thank you very much for your lecture. It's my privilege to have heard you. Thank you. And please glance at our upcoming lectures. Both of these. One is Vision for Naipur, Professor. Next Saturday. And then again, 21st. It is Bhatnagar's birthday. Shanti yeah. through Bhatnagar's birthday. But, okay. And that okay. lecture would be in the physical mode, a dual mode, organized at CSI or campus on the afternoon of 21st of February. And this Niper lecture is also in physical mode? Or no, no, it? that's an online mode. That's okay. Fine. So we start with the physical and hybrid, say hybrid mode from 21st February. February. Okay. Thank you very much, Grovasa, for this information. And thank you for... Thanks to everybody who joined today. Okay. And we close. Uh, Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Jai Hind, sir.